fans and that kind of stuff. They're much more heavier weight systems. They're not cloud-based. That's what we built a, a, a next generation. Okay, I'll turn. Sounds good. Cool. Other topics? Is there anything you miss about big companies that are stable like Cisco? Yeah, I learned a lot from Cisco. Um, you know, I watched John Chambers run Cisco a lot. I watched what he did. I watched how he communicated. So I'm not negative on what one can pick what one can pick up from great leadership in big companies. I just think you have to know why you're there. And um, you know, what do I miss? I mean, frankly, not much, but I, I don't trade in, I don't feel like, oh, I shouldn't have been there. I feel like during the time that I was there, it was just like being in school. I learned. I knew, I understood distribution, I understood communication, I understood how to motivate teams. I, I mean, I learned a lot of, very, well, just by watching and osmosis. But I don't, I, I don't look back on that and say I should have stayed there, you know, a lot longer. Um, you know, maybe the, the biggest thing is, is just simply the fact that when you're an entrepreneur, especially if you're a good entrepreneur, you're pretty much stuck. You don't, you know, on a bad day, you don't get to quit. And there is a huge freedom in the ability to quit because it's, go just go get another job. But it doesn't work like that. And so in a big company, you tend to sort of be like, well, that didn't work, but that's not my fault. Well, here, if it didn't work, it really is my fault. So, you know, that, that weighs on you a little bit, and there are days when, when uh, that's a pretty heavy burden to carry. Um, I believe you said you were 23 years old when you fundraised a billion dollars. Yeah. Did you ever find it difficult just because of your age to ask for money or, I don't know, anything within entrepreneurship? You know, I mean, one, it was, it was a pretty different time. Actually, I think it was harder at that time than it is now. I mean, now there are many, the tradition of people graduating from college and starting companies is more normal. Mm -hmm. At the time when I went to college, like, absolutely nobody did. So it was unusual. You know, to be in that position. Um, what what I find about, I would say, any kind of stigma, whether it's you're too young, you're too old, you know, you're of this gender or that gender or that race or this race or that background or that engine, that degree or that degree, you know, any kind of bias. In the end, um, what I believe is that whether those biases exist or not, if you're actually good, it doesn't matter. Uh, and that's my opinion. That, that's the way I look at the world. Uh, it's sort of like, I'm not going to worry about that. I can't control that. If I'm young, if I'm old, if I'm this or if I'm that. What I can control is what I do and what I say and what I, what I believe. And, and what I have, I have an optimistic view of humanity, which, which I think sh you know, I, I share with a lot of other entrepreneurs, which is just that you know, if someone turned you down, don't blame it on the fact that you were young. Don't blame it on the fact that, you know, blame it on the fact that you didn't do a good job. And do something. No, no victims. You said you do seed testing now. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, I'm involved with a group called Founder Founder Collective, which uh, which is a seed fund actually that is run by three friends of mine that I went to school with that do this full time. I I, I spend probably five percent of the time on it because I'm running a company, but. Um, you know, mostly it's uh, it's fun. It's like looking at early stage, really early stage stuff, putting in two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, figuring out you know the team, the big market space, and determining if it's a bet one wants to make. And um, you know, I got into it one because I knew the people involved. I had done a little bit of angel investing on my own prior, and this was a more structured way of doing it. And I wanted to do it in a way where it was very clear that my highest priority was my own company, not that. And so this gave me a way to do that. But it's been awesome. I mean, I've learned a lot from other entrepreneurs. It keeps me updated on, on uh, the community of what people are working on and thinking about and doing. I've met a lot of interesting people. Um, and i found that it's, it's been awesome. So it, um, it's different. I, I think the other thing that I've learned is that being an investor and being an entrepreneur are almost unrelated skills. They, they're, they're no, not to, I'm not sure they're any closer than like, uh, you know, construction work. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's just they're totally different. So they exercise a different part of the mind. They require you to think differently. I have a hard time actually. Uh, could, you know, I have at various times thought about being a full-time investor and, and decided that it's just not who I am. And I, and I, I have a hard time with it because 
my natural inclination is to help a group of people build something, which is actually not what you do in an entrepreneur, and primarily as an investor. You mostly spend your time disappointing people and saying no. Um, for Blue Ridge, how far along were you before you like um, recruited like a team. Did you already like start building a product, or you just had the idea? Yeah. So because this was my third venture, you know, I, I would say I went about it a little differently. Uh, I found my co-founder, who was very important, uh, who had built a lot of the search algorithms in Google, and and I felt like I needed a technical co-founder that was very strong in machine learning and algorithms. So I found him. Once once I found him, you know, we painted this picture that we could go build a dynamic web. And I pretty much went to the investors, and I mean, my pitch was actually, and we had nothing built. We had absolutely nothing. And so my pitch to the investor at that time, and this is in 2009, was, hey, we can build a service that's going to power every website and app in the world. And if it works, every website and app in the world is going to make a lot more money. And consumers on the web, a billion or two or five or seven, are going to be super happy. Does that sound good? And they were like, yeah, that sounds good. I mean, sure. Um, and then I was like, well, let's talk about what the risks are. Well, the ri is there a risk that if we build that, it isn't going to be a big company? And they were like, no, that, I mean, that, if that happens, we'll, we'll build a pretty big, big company. It's like, well, is there a risk that there won't be interest in this product if it exists and it succeeds in being able to do these, these things? And they were like, no, if you build it, it would succeed. So let's talk about what the real risk is. The real risk is, can we build such a service that works for every website and every app in the world? There was a fair amount of technical risk in this venture. And so what I did is I went to them and I said, well, okay, if we all agree that that's the risk, then how do we solve technical risk? Well, there's only two ways I know how to solve it, maybe three, and they're related. One, you have to have absolutely the best people who are the, the wizards in their field. And so I know a couple of them. They're sitting at a, bun at a bunch of these really big companies being paid a lot of money, so we need to get them out. And they're not going to get out you know, um, unless it's a well-funded venture. So one, we have to find the right one. Two, we have to have the ability for them to fail a bunch of times. Because they're not going to get it right. It's hard. And three, we have to have the money to both recruit those people and give them the ability to fail. So why don't you give me $5 million? <coughs> you agree that it's going to be an amazingly big company if this succeeds. And with $5 million, I'm actually not going to spend it at all. I'm just going to go get five or six of the best people in the world to work on this problem. And we're going to burn you know, almost nothing. But we're going to make, let them go at it for as long as it takes. And then they're going to succeed. And that's exactly what we did. And so we had six people in the company until I felt like the R&D risk was out. And there was really a business to be built. They were all engineers. And, we, and then uh, we went forward. So I don't mean to change direction, um, but was there an objective for relocating to, to, to France and then to London for the purpose of building this business? Or? Not really. I mean, it could have just been anywhere. It, it just, I just literally didn't speak French. I couldn't get anything done in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> but, but why relocate to Paris? I mean, why? Why, oh, why not? Why not do it in the U.S.? Yeah. Oh, because in the U.S. at that time, there were already a lot of big players building broadband services in the U.S. So it was, it was it would have been a much more competitive environment mm -hmm. to do it here. So that there was an unaddressed market opportunity in Europe. Okay. And, and that is a little bit about, you know, I would say that there are, you could almost bucket startups into one of kind of three major buckets. I have done types that, that fall in maybe two of the three, but there are three big, I would say, types of ideas. One type of idea is, you know, um, well-established market, and you've got the most amazing solution in the world that, to, you know, is better than everything else that's out. Tomorrow we come up with the best database. Well, there's a market for databases. We don't have to worry about that. The question is, can we build a database that's like 10 times better than Oracle's? That's one type of market. And in that type of market, the great thing is you don't take market risk. But your product and service has to be so freaking amazing because all the effects of the incumbent are so heavy. And if, especially if it's a big market, well, then that's even more true. So that's, that's kind of case number one. Case number two is you're basically, there is, you know, there is a latent problem, but the problem is not well understood, and therefore there is no well-established market. You are saying, I think everybody is going to be, uh, let's, let's come up with something random. You know, I, I think everybody is going to be 
uh, talking to walls across every university as they're walking the halls. I don't know, maybe. Suppose you're really passionate about that. You think walls should be speaking back to you and giving you directions to your next class, or you think they should be giving you other information. And maybe you're right. If you're right, you're certainly not going to face any competition. <laughs> right? You don't have any, but you have enormous market risk, you know, in terms of whether or not it actually, that there's demand for that. Things are not always that extreme, but I would argue that a lot of the services that have been built recently, including things like Uber, are that case. Because when the guy shows up early and says, hey, you know, we're going to network black cars and you're going to be on a phone and you're going to just get any black car, people are going to be like, you can get taxed, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, that's not going to work. There's no, there's no existing market for that. You have to have created that market. And you can win really big if you're right. But the risk on those ventures are, is extraordinarily high. Because you don't just have to be right. There have been people who've been talking about video conferencing for 30 years. But it just hasn't happened. Not in mass. And starting to kind of gradually. But if you were one of those amazing video conferencing startups 15 years ago, you failed. Not because your idea was wrong. Not even because there wasn't a market. But because you were early. So you have to not just get the market right, but the timing of that market right. And that's kind of the second, second uh, you know, kind of category, which is, uh, which is pretty different. And then there's the third category, which I would say is just is really, really hard, uh, which is completely unknown market and completely unknown solution. There you're basically in like research lab territory because you have to prove both sides of that. I had, I had one... Uh, one, uh, one uh, engineer come up to me and an and idea, you know, he was like, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to build 3D virtual reality for online shopping. And we're, and we're going to then make that, make every website, every online shopping website use it. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, first of all, you have to convince the, the, the company that it, that's going to use your software that they need it. Now, they have no idea they need it at all. And then you have to actually build this amazing 3D virtual reality shopping experience, and it actually has to work. All right, now you're in like dual mark, you know, dual territory. Other thoughts or questions? In your seed funding ventures, what do you look for in the companies that you do end up investing in? You know, at that stage, it is very much, you know, people in market. Um, it's very much about the individuals and um, about the market, you know, and about what they're going after. And at that early, really early stage, you know, there's, there's, there might be something, the product or the execution is really a evidence point one way or the other for one of the other two things. It's not that in and of itself it's meaningful because it's so early. But it is, it may be a representation of the type of people involved, and it may be a representation of their execution skills, maybe a representation of their vision as manifested by how they see the market. So that's mostly what it's about. And people say that, and it is very hard to kind of put, um, to be specific about what makes for the kind of people that succeed, because, because they come from all walks of life, and they come from all perspectives and all types. There are certain core characteristics, like persistence, like conviction. Most great entrepreneurs, I would say, have a view as to the inevitability of the success of their company as Insane as it sounds when you're two people in a garage. It's like, yeah, we, you know, we're going to go, like, whatever, put uh, black cars and, you know, network them together. And at the time when you're pitching that, it just seems so insane. But they are convinced as to the inevitability of that idea. And that conviction and the path to execute that comes through. You mentioned that you were an accidental entrepreneur. In fact, your boss and on Wall Street gave you the came at you with the yeah. telecom idea. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give for someone in the current environment who wanted to be a purposeful entrepreneur who wanted to reject kind of these set options of a salary man type job and pursue a more risky career in entrepreneurship? Um, you know, I first of all, I think be sure you want to do it. That's the first thing. Let's assume that you've done that soul searching. You've gotten the reality of what's involved. You know all the odds. You know all the challenges. And you're like, I'm in. OK. If you figure that out, now you're like, how do I go about doing it? You know, I think, I think then go through, uh, for me, I've found that it, you know, it's not about an epiphany. It's not about like some magical idea and I come up with some. It's, it's very much an exercise. It's very much a purposeful exercise. Like, 
okay, what are the areas I'm passionate about? Or I'm passionate about this. You gotta, you gotta narrow the scope. Then go through the analytical process of saying, is this one a good one? You know, what are the team elements? Can I go find some, you know, somebody to work with me on it? And just be very deliberate about the next milestone and the next milestone and the next milestone. And the next milestone could be research related, could be building, could be team related, could be money related, could be a whole range of possible things that you determine are the next most important thing to do. And just get going. And um, and there's especially here, there's such a great community of people who can help in a variety of different fashions that if you are really feel ready, then go do it. The thing to test for yourself is not is, is whether or not you feel ready. And here's a good test. Beyond the you know, a good test that, that, that I that I think is if you were working at a company, let's say you decide, okay, for two years I'm gonna go work at XYZ company, and then I'll go start my company. In the time that you're there, pretend you run that company. And just go through the mental exercise. You walk into the cafeteria. Is this the way you laid out the cafeteria? You go get a bonus. Is that, is that the bonus scheme that you would come up with? You go, uh, the, the company decides to release a product. Would you have released that product? Force yourself to make a call. And to the extent, put yourself in the, in the, in the shoes of it. Like, I'm running this big company. I can make any decision in the world. Do it. Force yourself, and then, at some point, you will start to feel like, you know what, my instincts are either terrible or my instincts are really good. And that almost gives you the confidence that you're ready. Any other um, you know, topics or questions? So you've been a pretty successful guy. Um, <laughs> Would you mind maybe sharing some of your low points, like running some of your businesses? Oh, yeah, I mean, I've had plenty of low points. I mean, as I said, I've been through eight fundraising processes. One in 2008 where I had absolutely, I mean, I literally pitched 100 people and just got told no. Um, that sucks. I mean, you know, and you think, you think you're better than that. You think your idea is better than that. I mean, how, how is it possible that 100% of it, I have like a zero for 80? record. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, that was rough. And that, that kind of, especially because for me, that happened when when I had my first kid, you know, I, was, I, I had, you know, to pay the bills. I kind of felt bad that my wife was working and kind of paying the bills while I was sort of goofing off, failing at raising money. So I had the emotional guilt that came along with that. You know, I did not sleep uh, very well. Um, I didn't think I was really a very good father because I wasn't fun to be around. Uh, it sucked all around. I mean, it just, it was uh, brutal. I mean, um, I've had periods of time where, um, you know, thought I was going to sell the company for a lot of money. The deal falls through. The company, one or two months later, it looks like it's not even going to be worth one-tenth of what it could have been sold at. Uh, and you look back with regret and you tend to be like, well, I should have made that happen in this way or that way or whatever it might be. Um, you know, I've had, I've, had, I've had periods of time where um, the business itself fell apart. And that is the burden of certainly a founder or a CEO, which is, um, you know, I'm always very honest with my team and with all of our challenges in general. But there are, but in the end, the buck stops with you. And so when there are things that really don't go well and you you're putting other people in a position where they need to trust your judgment and you don't really know the answer. That's a very uncomfortable view. It's okay to not know the answer but you're only accountable to yourself. It's a different thing to not know the answer and be accountable to a lot of other people you know, in the process. And that can create you know, a number of challenges. There's, there are so many low points, frankly, you know, that one of the one, one, the kinds of things that in running a business, I would say there's sort of maybe three big things that are the worst. One is money being an issue, because at the end of the day, you are never you're, you have never failed until you run out of money. The day you run out of money is the day you fail. Anything short of that, you have not failed. So money being an issue is a is is an enormous source of stress stress or failure. The second is when. Um, you know, you lose important customers, important users, and you build, let's say you build something. You build something, you have great pride in it. You're really proud of it. 
But the people for whom you build it to reject it. That's like being broken up. I mean, because you put your soul and your life and your passion into building something, and the verdict comes out, and it's really bad. And uh, you take it personal, because it's your thing. And so when they say no, or when they break up, or when they say, I'm not going to pay for this, whatever they say, <coughs> users or businesses, that is a very crappy thing. Uh, and the third one is when people disappear. You build, some, you build some kind of venture, and you think that this is the most important and best thing in the world, and you invest in people, and you hire a great team, and you invest in your team, and you believe in your team, and your you know, brothers and sisters in arms, and then they desert you, or they disappoint you, or they don't, uh, they're not the people that you expect them to be in a situation, and people are not perfect. Sometimes I manifest because they just, they quit on me. And you're like, how can you quit on us? You know, you take it personal. Those are tough. Those are, those are the kinds of moments that are really tough. How, how do you get through these low points? I, have, I, I mean, I, I work on this all the time, and I have some new techniques, so I'll share them with you. One of them is, and this, I, this is maybe a difference from early on versus now. So earlier on, you know, four people in a garage working on something. You know, you fail, you're kind of all in it together. Now, when people come to me with problems, and I have 250 people that work for me, like the shit has really hit the fan. It's really bad. Like there's something really bad going on. It's not. It's been not solved by a lot of other people, and then it got to me. And so when I'm dealing with it, it's really bad. And so I deal with a lot of crappy stuff through my day, and that can make you just a negative person if you're spending your entire, you know, day, not positively moving the ball forward, but rather, and you feel like it's all on you. It can really kind of weigh on. So one of my new techniques is every day at the end of the day, I'm, I think to myself, like, what's the great thing that happened today? And, and if you're a paranoid entrepreneur, which most entrepreneurs are, you actually don't focus on the good. You focus on all the bad, because you're always trying to, like, be better. And that's, that's, an important, that's an important thing to do. Recognize the good. Feel good about the good. Remember that some good things happened today or this week. <coughs> that's one. The second is... The short-term view versus the long-term view. This is all a great technique as well, which is, today was a really horrible day. One of these things happened or something else happened that was really bad. Immediately ask yourself, where was this business a quarter, six months ago, a year ago? Some longer period of time. And often what you find is, like the day sucks, but over the fullness of time, you've actually done a lot. And it makes you feel like that. And the third thing is, which I'm nowhere close to, is, you know, remember that the people that you love the most are in it with you. And don't take it out on them. It sucks to do that. And uh, remember, that, remember that that, in the end, is going to come back to you and benefit you personally as well as for your business. Take that seriously. We at 8 o'clock. Yeah, pretty much. Any, any last questions? Awesome. Thank you so much.